All right, so now uh, our next talk will be by Len Yeomans, our current environmental fellow. Um, and Len will be talking about uh, this year's, or last year's, same this year, uh, 2022's water quality monitoring um, results. Um, this is all data collected by many of the people who are in this room and on Zoom. Um, and none of this would be possible without uh, your dedicated support and help uh, early mornings throughout the summer. Um, and we really appreciate it. So I'll turn it over to Len. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Len, as Sean said. I am the 2022 through 2023 Environmental Fellow here at NEPRA. Um, so I am sort of in charge of uh, the Sloman program and our gathering of the water data. So it's really exciting to see so many familiar faces here. Um, and it's exciting to get a chance to talk about all this data and all the hard work that you guys put in. Um, so I'm gonna start with a pretty broad overview about who is NEPRA, what the data is, what we're going to be talking about, um, and then we'll get more in depth into the actual data itself. Um, so NEPRA is a uh, grassroots nonprofit organization based uh, right here in Canton, Massachusetts. Uh, we were originally founded in 1967 um, by a small group of individuals. Our original uh, focus was specifically on the river itself and its tributaries. Uh, making sure that we were protecting those tributaries, conserving those water areas. Uh, but in more uh, recent years and over the decades, we've expanded to the protection of the entire watershed area itself. Uh, so this includes the water, the water quality, the animals and the plants that live in the water and around the water, as well as the people. We do a lot of work to um, help educate the public like this event today. Um, we do a lot of going into fifth grade classrooms to teach them about water quality and storm water. Um, so it's really exciting that we get to do all of this work. And it's uh, exciting to see how the organization has grown over time. Um, so uh, in case people, uh, just to give a little vocab, make sure we're all on the same page here. A watershed is an area of land uh, in which any water that falls from the sky and lands within that area of land is all going to drain into the same source. In this case, it's the Neponza River. We do love a good common sense naming convention. It makes our lives much easier. Uh, so we can see that uh, the Neponza River watershed starts down south in Foxborough before uh, heading up in a generally northeasterly direction before coming out in the Boston Harbor. Um, so uh, we have majority of our watershed is fresh water. We do have some brackish water in the estuary um, as it heads out into the ocean. And the general place uh, where that water transfers from the fresh water to the brackish water um, is the Baker Dam, uh, which is right about where that uh, second arrow from the top is. Uh, so right beneath Dorchester, that arrow right there, that is about where the Baker Dam is, if you're looking for a visual reference there. Now, SWIMIN was founded in 1995 by NEPRA, so it's one of the older water quality uh, monitoring programs in our area. Um, and we, the whole point of this is to monitor water quality. Um, so we have a couple different factors that we're monitoring that I'll get into today. Um, but generally, you should know that we have 41 different sites across the entire watershed that we are measuring uh, for all of these different factors. We measure them once a month, six times a year at six in the morning. Um, really, I, it amazes me that every month all of these volunteers turn out, put in their time and energy to do this. Lord knows I get paid to do this and I struggle to get up in the morning. So it's really uh, such an honor to work with such dedicated people. Um, so uh, we have over 41 sites, which means it takes at least 41 volunteers to reach all of those sites, plus volunteers to be our drop-off coordinators, like Judy and Fred, who I can see in the audience today. So good to see you guys. Um, and then we also have people who go around and uh, specifically look at dissolved oxygen, which is a whole nother round of volunteers. And the whole reason why we collect all of this data is because we want to ensure the health of the river. 
And we wanna be able to do that by putting the most effort and the most resources we can into the projects that need the most help. So by gathering this data and analyzing it, uh, we're able to figure out which parts of the watershed need the most help, the most love, the most TLC, um, and which parts of the watershed we can take a step back from, from to focus on other places. Um, so being able to have all this data and have such a large uh, history of data to compare to uh, really gives us an edge when we're trying to figure out where we need to prioritize our work. Um, so before we get into the sp specific parameters we're going to be talking about today, um, I want to uh, specifically highlight the difference of uh, this year's weather to last year's weather. And I mean 2022's weather to 2021's. Um, so the data that we gathered in 2022, it was the worst drought we've had in over 50 years in Massachusetts. So we're looking at very dry data, uh, data that has um, these samples were severely affected by the lack of water. In some cases, we were unable to gather samples at certain locations due to them fully drying up because of this drought, which is a great difference to 2021, in which it was one of the wettest years in recent record. Um, and by that, I mean going back into 1895, which uh, NOAA has record of. So super wet versus super dry. It's going to make um, some differences in the data that I'll point out to you, um, but it's just something to keep in mind as we look at this data because it can affect some of the parameters. Now we sample for uh, four sets of parameters here uh, at NEPRA. We're only going to be talking about three today uh, because the fourth is nutrients and that can vary from site to site, year to year. So it's uh, easiest just to focus on uh, the main three. The first of which is dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen is uh, most easily understood as the amount of oxygen that is available in water uh, for aquatic organisms, be these fish, insects, etc. So dissolved oxygen, having a lot of dissolved oxygen is very important for a number of reasons, but primarily because there are things in the water and they need it to breathe. Um, so if there is a lack of oxygen in the water, which can be caused by numerous different things, uh, this can cause uh, insects to die off, fish to die off, specifically called fish kills, um, and lots of other great stuff that we don't like to happen in our river. Um, oxygen can also be lost due to other effects and parameters in our rivers. Um, Algae growth, plant growth can all affect dissolved oxygen. So it's one way to understand a bunch of different things that might be happening in our rivers and waterways. Uh, the next thing we're gonna talk about is total phosphorus. Uh, total phosphorus is the amount of phosphorus that we find in the water. Uh, phosphorus being a nutrient that uh, is vital to a lot of organisms and a lot of growth, uh, but also that can lead to growth in areas that we don't want. It's most often seen as a form of agricultural or urban runoff, um, and that causes it to build up in much more um, enormous amounts than would naturally occur. Uh, this is most obviously seen in Crack Rock Pond every year as it turns um, turf green, as Sean would say. Um, and this is because of, uh, that's all algae. That entire green swath is just algae covering the complete surface of the water. Algae loves phosphorus. It finds it very delicious and very nutritious. Um, and so the more phosphorus that is in the water, the easier it is for this algae to grow and expand. And when this algae expands and then eventually dies, it's gonna take a lot of oxygen out of the water leading to our dissolved oxygen problem. So these are very closely linked and that's why it's really important to keep an eye on both of them. Our final parameter that we're going to be talking about today is E. coli. E. coli is a bacteria. Nobody likes it. Uh, it can make us very sick for a number of different reasons. Um, and it's most commonly found in fecal matter. So it's gross stuff uh, and it doesn't, it's not a good sign to find it. 
but it's really important to track because we do get it in our waterways for a number of reasons. It also has the most direct or easily recognizable impact on human health. People can get very sick of it, sick from it. Whereas with dissolved oxygen or high phosphorus levels, it's not as easily noticeable in people. Specifically, uh, E. coli can get more intense uh, from lots of different things, but we see it most often in fecal matter. So dog poop is one of the major uh, contributors in our waterway to our E. coli levels. We also monitor E. coli because E. coli can often uh, move, uh, excuse me, be used as an indicator for more intense bacteria, such as norovirus and giardia. So those are even worse than just E. coli on its own. So it's really helpful to track. In particular, uh, one of the most common examples of the tracking of E. coli that we see in our watershed is at Lake Massapog. Lake Massapog in particular, their community center beach, really uh, struggles with E. coli every year, E. coli growth. Um, in 2022, they had to close the community center beach eight separate times. Uh, and this led to the beach being closed for 50% of their summer season, which was very devastating for the members of Sharon because um, that is a very beloved beach. And it's a really common way where people get access to the water. So the fact that the beach had to be closed for the safety and health of the residents of Sharon really shows that E. coli is something that we need to work on in our watershed. Now, one last slide before we get into the data. Stay with me. Um, these are the exact standards that we hold our data to. So when we're measuring uh, the amount of each of these um, chemicals, nutrients, uh, bacteria in our water, uh, we're measuring them against the state standard. And that is how much the state uh, allows to be in our water and it to still be considered safe. So if it is, um, it, if it is greater uh, than the standard, or if it, goes against the standard, if it's um, more intense than the standard, that is when we're going to see some problems. That is when you're going to get that failure markage. So looking firstly at dissolved oxygen. In dissolved oxygen, we have the cold water standard and the warm water standard. This is because lots of our organisms in our watershed really rely on cold water. Cold water, as we know from thermodynamics, can hold a lot more oxygen than warm water. So having these consistent cold water areas, cold water streams are very important for certain fish populations. In particular, our trout populations could not survive without these consistently cold waters. So um, cold waters, it needs to have a greater dissolved oxygen content of six milligrams per liter versus warm water organisms, which is generally the rest of aquatic organisms. Um, they can handle a bit less oxygen because they're used to that warmer water, which is going to hold less oxygen by its nature. So that's going to be uh, greater than five milligrams. <sighs> Nextly, so if it's any less than five, that's going to be no bueno. That's not going to be good. Um, with our phosphorus, we have the flowing standard and the lake and pond standard. Uh, with phosphorus, it's in particular, we're looking at algae is one of the big things. So it's much easier for algae to flow, uh, to grow in slow flowing water like lakes and ponds, which is why the standard is so much uh, lower. It's at 0 0.025 uh, milligrams per liter versus in flowing water, it's 0.1. So that's a pretty stark difference to think about there. And then finally, um, for E. coli, we have the swimming standard versus the boating standard. And this is sort of, can you submerge your entire body within it? Or is it just okay to get a little bit of splashed on you? Um, so for the submerging the entire uh, body, that is going to be less than 235. Uh, for the splashing or boating standard, that's going to be less than 1260. Okay, that was a lot of numbers. We're going to get into some graphs. So with these graphs, this is the 2022 
average. So we're looking at the average by the months. So all of the sites averaged per month. So uh, we can see here that we have a bit of a dip as the uh, temperature increases. Uh, I mentioned earlier that temperature is one of those main things that affects the amount of oxygen that can exist in the water. And we can really see this here. As the water gets hotter, as the summer gets hotter, the amount of oxygen that is available becomes less and less, and the higher likelihood those sites had to fail. You'll also notice that in uh, some of the months, we're not reaching that 100% of the total sites. That's because a lot of the sites dried up, and so we lost some of the sites um, that we would have measured. So you could even consider that failure level to be even higher due to the full lack of water. Um, now, comparing this to 2021's data, we can sort of see the difference here, right? 2021, pretty standard, pretty flat, a bit of a dip in the warmer months, but it's remaining fairly straight versus the severe dip in 2022. And this is really showing how that extreme amount of rain versus the drought is gonna affect that. That heavy amount of rain, that water is constantly getting refilled. It is dealing with a lot less full sun on it all the time, right? Versus when there's in a drought, there's less and less water available, which means the water can heat up faster and faster. It takes less time to boil one cup of water versus 10 cups, right? So the less water that's available, the easier it is for it to heat up, the easier it is for it to lose oxygen content. Mm -hmm. little I'm sorry, I forgot to say. So we had a question about these little droplets. Um, so if you look at the bottom of the graph, there's like a little raindrop. So those are the events where it actually rained the day that the sample was taken. So we have wet sampling days and we have dry sampling days. So was it raining when we gathered the samples? If it was yes, it was a wet day. So kind of interestingly, or I guess ironically, um, if you were to use the incorrect ver but common version of ironic, um, during 2021, when we were having the, just those ma massive immense amounts of rain, excuse me, only one of the days that we sampled, was it actually raining uh, versus in 2022, when it was a drought, for some reason, three of the days we sampled, it had rain. Um, and this we'll see in um, some of the other parameters did have a little bit of a difference, which is interesting. Okay. Um, yes, this is the map. Um, so this is looking at each site for its yearly average um, of 2022. Um, so sort of the Western, side of the watershed seem to be uh, failing a bit more, uh, but also lots of sites where we just didn't have enough data. Well, this could be from a volunteer error, but this is also from drought. Uh, we just didn't have enough samples. Uh, moving on to tool phosphorus. So two out of the three worst uh, uh, months, two out of the three worst days, uh, we're noticing those are wet sampling days. So this is a phosphorus is another one of those things. Since it's so heavily impacted by rainflow, by water coming in, by uh, those flowing uh, runoff, stormwater events, bringing in that phosphorus from the dirt, from the streets, that makes sense that we're seeing that dip there. Um, when it's very interesting when you compare it to last year or 2021 in that um, only one, the one wet sampling day is sort of in the middle of the worst days of the highest um, failure rates. Now, um, there's a lot of things that could be coming into this. Um, the way I am best understanding it is that since there was such consistent flooding and consistent moving of the phosphorus through the system, um, that one sampling day that there was actually raining on that day, it makes sense that it would be slightly higher because we're getting those fresh 
um, phosphorus coming in. It's not like the phosphorus has been flowing through for a bunch of days. And so the, the big hike at the start of it has well gone past. We're getting that big hike right at the front. So it makes sense that the second worst is going to be on that wet day. Uh, and then, so those were for flowing standards. This is for the ponds. So already very different, much rougher. Um, looks like we definitely need to put more of our resources into uh, working to lower the total phosphorus amounts in our lakes and ponds in the watershed. Um, once again, we can see worst day was a rainy day. And this is really hammered home when we look at last the 2021 information in that started off with not a whole ton of rain. And there were some sites that were still doing great. They were still passing it. And then as soon as those torrential rain hit every single month, complete failures. Um, so you can really see it there. All right. And then again, this is each site, its average for the year across the map. I know these are really tiny, um, but I appreciate you guys taking the time to look at these. Um, once again, it seems like the Western side has the most failures but we're looking pretty good spread throughout. Pretty, mostly looks good, which is always good to say and to see. Um, all right, finally, we're moving into our E. coli here. So this is the percentage of sites meeting the E. coli standard for 2022. So once again, we can see as that summer heat hits, we're getting that dip. Uh, three of the four worst days were also rainy days. E. coli is another one of those things where if it's raining, if we get that first flush, we're going to see more of it. Um, and we can also see this in looking at 2021's data, because the one rainy day of 2021 is when we by far had the worst E. coli, um, which is very interesting. Um, Um, and once again, you know, those consistent flushes of E. coli are keeping, or not, excuse me, when we have that consistent rain, we can see that there's more green, more green over the long term. We're still having a fair amount of only reaching the boating standard, but the amount of failures is less versus when we only have a couple really heavy rains, we're seeing more failures across the board. We're seeing more just reaching of the boating standard. Looking at the map, um, we can see that the tributaries are really where it's struggling, um, but the main stem is doing pretty good. All right, and then continuing to look at E. coli data as it is sort of uh, the main thing that a lot of people wanna know about, the main thing that it's easiest for you to understand if you don't know a ton about environmental science. Um, we're looking at seasonal average per site. So uh, each site, its own average for the year. So of the sites uh, for this year, um, so we have 126 CF marked off here. That is the boating standard. So that is the um, lower standard, but you're still passing, right? So of our sites for 2022, only 10 of them, their average was consistently below. The rest of them, this is just the average. So plenty of these sites still passed on some days. Oh, this, that's the swimming standard. I looked at my math wrong. That's the average. It's the seasonal average. I got my math wrong. Thank you, Sean. Um, so yeah, we have some places to improve, uh, but not terrible. Um, but if you compare it to last year where we had 12 sites, yeah. Um, so more sites that are reaching that swimming standard, which is good to see. Uh, this could also be because of when we're in hotter seasons, it's easier for E. coli to grow. Uh, when we're, you know, growing our samples in the lab to figure out 
how much we're growing. They like to grow at a hotter temperature. So that helps as well. Here's the seasonal average. Uh, again, Baker Dam pointed out fair amount of failures, not too many, no datas, um, but still a lot of yellow. Um, and this is really important information because this is what we use each year for the report card. Um, so the report card is something that we've been doing for the past three years in conjunction with a bunch of other organizations, but uh, most, I guess, famously the EPA. Um, and so this is the three-year average uh, for uh, E. coli data specifically. And so um, this is the 2021 report card. Uh, so this is not the most up-to-date information. We're still working on the 2022 report card. Uh, it'll be coming out in June, June, June. Um, so get an update then. Um, it's a very fun event, uh, us and the uh, Mystic and the Charles uh, River Watershed Association all release our report cards at the same time together. Um, and so it's a great way to compare the data and the report cards are also a great way to look at the data and understand the data if you don't have a whole lot of experience in this sort of stuff. You know, we got a letter grade system, we got percentiles, we're breaking it down by stream, it's color coded. Um, so you can really see, okay, what water body do I want to look at? How much of the time did it um, comply with the standards? What is that on a letter grade scale? So it's really easy to see. Okay, Frack Rock Pond for E. coli, they're doing great. They are 100% of the time maxing it out, having a great time. Versus, say, Meadow Brook, Meadow Brook is really struggling. So maybe if I want to go swimming, um, I'm going to go for something like Willet Pond or Massapog Brook versus Meadow Brook. So all of this information, all of these numbers, that was a lot. What does it mean? What's sort of the, the summary of all of this? What's the real question that people want to know? Is the Neponset safe? Yeah, pretty much, generally, yes. There are some areas of the Neponset that uh, you shouldn't swim in, but we'll talk about that in a second. Most of the Neponset, it's pretty safe to swim in. It's always best to check with your local uh, water organizations, your town, of which areas are safest to swim in, uh, looking again at um, uh, the beach in Sharon, uh, the massive hog beach. Excuse me. Uh, you know, half of the time, great to swim there. The other half of the time, you couldn't swim there. So making sure that you're always up to date with your local town's information is really key to staying safe. Also, good rule of thumb, never swim the day after it rains, because uh, that's when your phosphorus and E. coli levels are going to be at its highest. Now, of course, people are going to want us to talk about the Superfund site. Uh, the Superfund site is um, just by Baker Dam. Um, and while it is a great place to go walking and biking and enjoying the surrounding area, maybe go canoeing, uh, maybe if you're a catch and release fisherman, um, because of the PFAS that is in the water, because of the, did I say the wrong acronym? PCBs, thank you. <laughs> I knew it was one of the Ps. Uh, because of these chemicals, it's really not safe to eat the fish. It's really not safe to uh, swim, so get full body submersion in the water, or really play in the mud. The mud is where most of that is going to be stored. Um, now, our data uh, that we gather in swimming uh, does not look at PFAS. It has nothing to do with what makes the Superfund site the Superfund site. So uh, while this is really awesome information, if you're looking for more information about the Superfund site, this is not the place to look. Uh, there is a link here on this QR code if you want to learn more. I highly suggest you head over there. I'd just like to wrap up by giving one final thank you to the volunteers. We seriously could not do this without you. Thank you so much. Uh, you guys mean the world to me and this organization. Uh, and now I'll open the floor for questions. Thank you.
Yeah, Rory. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Sean, do you remember the exact temperature, Sean? So um, it's kind of a complicated question. Um, <laughs> so the, the, uh, do you want to come over here, Sean? Yeah. Um, so the question Rory asked was um, the difference between warm and cold water. And I'll say it's a, it's a complicated question because um, DEP has its own um, uh, assessment for what constitutes cold versus warm water. Um, that has to do with the presence of cold water fish like trout, like suckers, um, but also an existing pattern of water below 20 degrees Celsius, um, dissolved oxygen above six, uh, six milligrams per liter. Um, we tend to take a look at it um, across the watershed so we know uh, just because just because something is designated warm water doesn't mean it shouldn't have water above six milligrams uh, per liter. Um, and also we have a number of what are not cold water streams according to DEP, but are cold water fish resources according to Mass Fish and Wildlife. And the exact distinction between those, I don't know. <laughs> um, it is, is, it's something we've been working on, um, but we, um, uh, we take special interest in those brooks uh, for their presence of um, brook trout and, uh, and suckers. So if I were to look at your chart, Yeah, so again, the, the report card is based solely on E. coli values. So it's not temperature or not, or not or dissolved oxygen. One of the things we're hoping to get as we have a little bit more uh, capacity as an organization is to put out report cards for E. coli, as well as phosphorus, as well as dissolved oxygen, try and put them all out at the same time. But at the moment, um, the one that has, the, as Lund said, the one that has the biggest health impact is E. coli, so that's what we try and get out first. Um. Do we have any questions in the chat or over Zoom? Yeah, I can read one of the questions off the chat, um, yeah. which was, have you encountered harmful algal blooms, HABs, for example, cyanobacteria? We already got one ex um, response in the chat from Wara and Sharon, who said they did have HABs closed Lake, uh, Lake Mass Bog for a couple of weeks in 2021 after heavy rains and runoff. Um, but yeah, are there other encounters with HABs or cyanobacteria? Um, as far as I am aware, in 2022, we did not experience cyanobacteria, but there was that one significant case in 2021. Um, so I know the lake organization is keeping an eye on it. All right. Oh, it did occur. Thank you, Rory. Yeah. I know of two that occurred, but as a club leader, I'm not a beach goer, so I don't go. Just the community center beach. So the question is, what lake beach was I talking about? I'm just talking about the community center beach. The other beach. Not the, not the one with. Right, the main beach, Memorial Park Beach is the primary beach, yes. and it's on the south, uh, the west side of the lake, the yes. east side of the community center. Yes. That's the one that uh, I think you're reporting. Yes. So most of the not identified with the community. So I'll ask question, just review back into those in <laughs> Yeah, so. so so there was just clarification about which beach I was talking about. I'm only talking about the community center beach and like in Sharon, uh, that is the beach that has had the most consistent trouble. Oh. Okay. Is that from surrounding um, property owners? Um, so is the problem because of the surrounding property owners uh, at the community center beach? Um, so we're still figuring out specifically what is causing it. We're actually doing a lot of hot spotting work. So figuring out where the sources of the coli is coming from. Uh, we haven't been able to point it down to property owners or um, animal species or anything like that yet. Uh, but that's something that we're definitely working on in the future. Okay, um, we're gonna take a question from Zoom first, if you don't mind, thank you. Um... Now the question, um, who does your lab work? Um, um, 
So we send all of our water or all of our uh, samples to uh, the Deer Island Lab. Uh, so the MWRA Water Treatment Lab on Deer Island. So thank you, MWRA, for doing our lab samples. For free. <laughs> thank you very much. We are very grateful. Um, yeah. Oh, yes, Fred. Uh, this is a little outside your data set, but I, you know, so many of the streams dried up, and in particular, you were, some of the streams were trying to protect the drought, the trout, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how the wildlife did in general and how, what happened to your trout streams? Right? Did they suffer a lot or what? Um, so the question was, this is sort of outside of the data set, but maybe someone in the Zoom call or the chat can give me a better answer about this. Um, sort of since there was so much drought and certain streams drying up and heating up, um, how was the wildlife, like the trout doing, did that have effect on any of their populations? Um, that, as far as I'm aware, I think it was... <laughs> Is there any GBTU members who want to answer me? So I will say um, a lot of the, the drought, uh, fully dried up streams we uh, encountered, most of them were not our cold water streams. Um, uh, Pine Tree Brook, which is a trout stream, did dry up in the middle section, uh, but the headwater stayed um, stayed flowing. Um, and so we don't have any, um, it's not something we, we collected that on, but we didn't get any reports of massive fish kills with the exception of um, the East Branch uh, uh, of Dinaponset in Canton, uh, which is actually not technically the East Branch, it's the stormwater bypass of the East Branch um, where Typically water flows over it uh, as it dried out and it was diverted through what is the, technically the main channel of the East Branch. Um, fish did die out in that channel. And it was a massive fish kill. Um, but that's the only report that I'm aware of. Yeah, that's also the only report I'm aware of. There's a lot of crayfish and turtles and all kinds of things. I know a long pine tree book. They're all in there, but I don't know whether they're still there and how long it takes them to repopulate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, the good news is trout are, are fairly mobile, so they can, you know, move and, and uh, get out of the way as long as there's no um, barriers to their passage. And luckily on Pine, Pine Tree Brook, you know, we took out this year, we took out uh, the dam at Camp Nav, um, which is, which was one of the, the major hurdles between uh, Pope's Pond and the, the Blue Hills for them to seek refuge. All right. So. I think you had a follow-up question here. Though. Yes. I do have a question. The, the E. coli, the source is not just pets. It's it's also septic system. Is that? Yes. Uh, yeah. So it was a follow-up question about um, the lake in Sharon and the E. coli levels. Um, so it is not just um uh, pet waste, uh, that's sort of the one that we push because it's easiest to get the community involved uh, to do something about it. Uh, but septic systems are another uh, big problem that we do see. Um, it's just a bit more of a hassle for the everyday person. Um, but they do make a very significant difference and we are looking more into it. Yes. There's also issues with municipal sewer systems as well um, and any coli from municipal sewer systems. Yeah. Oh, oh, the, the leak. Yeah, that have yeah, because I mean, many of these systems are over a hundred years old, um, and often are running in the same place as the pipes taking the water off the road. So, um, the town of Canton runs through the town. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how good it is. But... All right. Um, another question from Zoom. Um, how can we potentially get the Canterbury Brook in Mattapan onto the report card and monitor that better? I will say that Canterbury Brook is not actually in the Neponset watershed. It's, I believe it's technically in the Charles watershed. Um, so we could check with them, see what they're doing in terms of monitoring it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe even check the Charles River watershed report card uh, because it might be on their report card. Um, so you might have find your information there. All right. Oh yes. I'm going to chime in on the on the question of the report card data as well. Um, in addition to the 41 sites we monitor the swim program, we also have a supplemental program uh, we do with the Excel students, 
which is um, an adult education program. So it's an additional five sites. Uh, we actually just passed the three year mark with them. Uh, so now we're able to incorporate their data into our report card. Uh, and we're also looking um, for the estuary portion just past the Baker Dam. Uh, we currently don't sample anywhere there, but MWRA does. So we're looking to incorporate their data and put, get it reported in our report card as well to kind of magnify its impact. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the room? Did I did I see a hand, Rory? Uh, I'm going to save it for further discussion in terms of where I think we should go. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, Laura, you've been waiting for so long. Do you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? Uh, sure. It was just um, a clarification. Uh, yeah. When we got the full data through the end of September, the community center beach was closed more like 44% of the time. Um, but the town has uh, decided that um, that next summer on a pilot basis, we will close that beach to swimming leave it open for uh, boating and fishing, and we'll continue to do the work to look at the um, sources. We have a volunteer who's going through, you know, property data in um, some of the sensitive areas to look at the status of the septic systems. And we just started to pilot some um, sort of PCR testing to determine what kind, what the sources of E. coli are. The one issue there is it can tell you whether in addition to E. coli, you have human DNA or geese or dog, but it can't tell you, my understanding is the concentrations, um, which ideally we want to know. So we need to do more work in that um, area and appreciate the hotspot hot spot survey that we piloted with, um, with, with your help uh, uh, this summer, in addition to joining um, the Sucker Brook, which is one of the areas where the E. coli coming into the lake is the highest um, to add that in as a new swimming site. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Laura. I really appreciate uh, you being able to contribute and clarify. Any other questions in the room or in chat? Right. Well, thank you everybody so much for coming. Uh, it was a real joy. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, my email is right here. If you're in the room, I can give you my business card. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>